Hey, today on Flywire, we're going to run a uh, talk that I gave to the BPPP uh, live program in Arlington, Texas at the beginning of May. Um, got to, it was crowded. There's, uh, I think it was pretty much uh, all the seats were filled and I appreciate everybody being there. I think you'll enjoy it. I'm going to talk about how to stay in the box. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, just coming up immediately, is uh, the talk that I gave to the BPPP uh, live event in Arlington, Texas, uh, beginning of May 23. And uh, it's a long one. Uh, I filmed it with uh, my uh, 360 camera, so the file was, was huge. And uh, it's probably going to be huge when uh, it goes to YouTube. Take forever to upload. But... Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I talk about how to stay in the box, and what the box really is is it's a it's a philosophy thing, and it talks about boundaries and how we treat boundaries, how we stretch our own personal boundaries, et cetera. So uh, let's get to it. Thank you for the introduction. Actually, I wasn't clapping for myself. I was clapping to sync the video because you guys are all on video. You're going to be on a YouTube video. I'm going to put one. Up, put this up on Flywire, I think. And if I get it right, sometimes I screw up the audio. Sometimes I screw up the video. So hopefully it'll work. So I was just observing to Seth. He's an ex, he's another Air Force guy. That uh, this crowd is way different than the standard military crowd. I was watching the room fill up, and the first rows here are the ones that filled up. First, that's not the way they do it in the military. Everybody sits in the back. And, you know, you end up having to get the, hey, come on, come on up here. Don't, you know, the first two or three rows are empty because everybody's in the back. So that's great. Big crowd. Thanks for coming. I appreciate that. And I think it's going to be a good time. I'm going to talk about staying in the box. And for me, the box is really a philosophy sort of thing. So it's a little bit different. Um, I think I, probably everybody here today is an accomplished pilot. I'm not talking about... Um, you know, a graduation of level of experience levels or anything like that. I'm really talking about a philosophy. And uh, I think that we can learn from each other. So one of the reasons I do fly where, if you've seen the, the show, uh, the YouTube channel, is I think that one of the things that, uh, that uh, it doesn't really exist like it does when I was a kid, when I was growing up. My dad was a pilot, and I spent every weekend out at the airport with him. And people would tell stories there. They'd tell flying stories. And I also learned one of the things about stories is, is a good story only has to be 10% true. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, there's a lot of good learning experiences from people telling stories. And uh, that I don't really see much of anymore. And that's why I do Flywire as a way of uh, uh, talking about things in a, in a way that a lot of people don't think about generally. And that will stimulate conversation, hopefully, uh, for people out in uh, in the viewer viewing world, so to speak. I think that's a best practice, and uh, that's sharing of information, okay? And uh, thankfully, I think ABS and uh, BPPP have that same philosophy. That's why we're doing these kind of events, and I think that's really important. We also do an instructor crosstalk where we talk to just instructors and talk about those different techniques and things we need to look at. Um, for me, this box idea, as I'm going to describe this, uh, it's, uh, if I can use the analogy of the old-time maps before they knew that uh, the world was round, you know, they'd just say, okay, we don't know what's over here, so beyond this, there be dragons, okay? And beyond the borders of the box, the various boxes we're talking about, there are dragons when we're flying, and some of them breathe fire. So we need to, we need to pay attention to that. So this is uh, the things I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about boxes are a good thing. I'm going to describe a few of them and how they relate to flying then, and then how to teach boxes. And when I talk about teaching boxes, it's not just from an instructor point of view. It's from a student's point of view, because basically we're all students. If we're not all learning or continue to learn, then that to me is that's the danger. When, that's when complacency sinks in. When you think that you know it all and you don't have to, anything to learn, that's when you're in trouble. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. And if you guys don't have questions for me, I've got some for you. I'll just warn you so you can come up with some more. So this isn't about FedEx. That's Jim Peets, or Pites in uh, his F-33C. Really excellent show if you've never seen it. So what are boxes? 
Well, you can, uh, uh, I think it's a fairly liberal term. This is a, uh, this is a mathematical way of viewing uh, or talking about sets, okay? So a set, uh, we can talk about uh, beings that can swim, that can breathe air, and have legs. And we list these, just a general uh, number of them. And what are the intersection here, right in the middle? Uh, the ones that can do all of those things are sea turtles, humans, do and ducks, and dogs, you know, that match those things. So that's a subset. That defines another box. So that's kind of the way it is in flying. You know, we have uh, all kinds of different boxes or different areas, and they all have their own boundaries, and those boundaries are what I find is important. Okay. So here is what, uh, hopefully you all are familiar with this VG diagram, okay? And what we have is this airspeed on the bottom and uh, G, load factor, on the left. And this describes the operating region where we can operate the airplane. So we're not a car. We operate in 3D, and uh, that creates uh, certain specific issues that we have to pay attention to. So we're familiar with 1G level flight, the stall here. Then uh, this is an accelerated stall. Realize that all a stall is is you exceed the critical bound, the angle of attack. That can happen at any speed, and you see that from this diagram. So this goes up to this looks like a utility category VG diagram because it's at 4.4 G. If it was standard category, it'd be 3.8. So you go up to maneuvering speed. Okay, eh, that's generally a little bit high for uh, GA airplanes at maneuvering speed at at, uh, at 120. Uh, eh, 120 is really not so bad, but 4.4 G. The reason why I say it's high is the way they describe uh, maneuvering speed is via gust loads. In uh, the FAA, you know, when you do uh, Part 23 and you're trying to design an airplane, this is the maximum gust load it can carry. So you got to have the speed down to the point where it won't exceed that in this gust of X number of meters per second. Uh, they use metric. And uh, so that's where that, that's defined as. In the uh, Air Force world, in the fighter world, we have a similar thing. It's called corner velocity, okay? It's very close to maneuvering speed, and in that it's max G. So cornering velocity is the slowest speed at which you can attain max G, okay? So the F-15E that I flew, that speed was uh, 440 knots for 9 Gs, okay? So and, uh, the, what is important here and that I want to talk about, and the reason why I'm mentioning it is onset rates are everything, okay? In the, in the fighter world, uh, I have a little description about onset rates. So I went through regular UPT and, and flying the T-38, graduated with that, and then when you go into the lead-in fighter training program, that's what they called it at the time, and you fly the T-38, but it's got, it's got the ability to drop bombs and stuff. So then you do fighter maneuvers. You do, uh, you do air to air, you drop bombs, you do low level navigation and all that, but you fly it like you're flying a fighter, not a trainer. So we're doing uh, defensive BFM and I'm, uh, my, my IP is saying, you, you, you know, you're slow in the break turn. You know, you, you do this setup, you get all set up and you gotta talk with your hands and your flying fighters. So you get all set up like this, and you put your lift vector, it's a whole different discussion, on the, the bad guy, and then you do a brake turn. So he's saying, I'm slow. And I, I don't get it. What are you talking about, I'm slow? I'm doing a brake turn. I'm hitting the G and all that. And he goes, no, let me demo one to you. Okay? So, okay, great. We set up. Then, then it's fights on. And he was right into the G. And when he, and he did fights on, it was like this. Uh, my head was down by the stick just like that. <laughs> and I couldn't get it up. And to me, it was like, okay, I get it. I understand what onset rates are. The point is, is that onset rates like that in the fighter world do not belong anywhere near GA. GA airplanes are not designed for that. And when I teach, when I, especially when I teach UPRT, I talk about that quite ex extensively, okay? Structural damage can occur, and your onset rate, you can still stay within your G allowed, but your onset rate can exceed that structural damage. Uh, so there's more here, but we can, I want to press. This is from the F-33C. Okay, so if you notice this, if you saw it before, uh, or you know the uh, yellow line for the Bonanza, 
that's uh, basically 167 knots, okay? And the loop, the Cuban 8, and the Emmelman are all above that. The, the loop and the Cuban 8 are right at yellow line. You realize the F-33C is a plus 6, minus 3G airplane. It's not 4.4, minus 2. It's, uh, I can go all the way to 6Gs here, and if I'm going over the top, I have to be at 176 knots. So I can do 6Gs there, but notice this right here, the warning. What does it say? The warning says, do not apply controls abruptly. That's the most important part of that sentence. It's that onset rate. It's the gradual onset. You don't do it abruptly. And so that way you don't over-G the airplane. But remember one thing I'm, I'm going to foreshadow a little bit later in the talk. Remember the Immelman speed. We're going to talk about that in a second. All right, so here's another interesting thing here. This is another fun boundary. It's another box. It's the uh, L over D curve. We look at it a little bit differently. Okay, most of the time we're used to looking at it as uh, the line that goes up this way and then hooks over and stops. And we know that the top of that is the L over D max. This is a different, to me, this is actually a useful way of looking at L over D the way we actually fly airplanes. So from this diagram, it shows you that we have st speed stability this way, and at some point you're using maximum thrust, the airplane won't go any faster because the induced drag is going to keep it from going faster. You go slower, you use less thrust, you go slower. L over D max is right here, okay? So it's a much slower airspeed than what... I like to fly, to be honest with you. I like to go fast. But then the slower we get, the more we have speed instability. And the interesting intersection here is, again, with maximum thrust. When you get to that point, then you can be, have all the power the engine has. You can still stall the airplane. You're going to still exceed your controllability of the airplane. I think this is the area. Loss of control in flight is always a perennial top three killer in the accident lists, and it's one of my soapboxes. This, to me, is the area that I talk about when I teach uh, quite extensively. The L over D max, though, is, to me, very interesting. So, uh, old Bob Siegfried, does anybody remember him? Yeah, tremendous guy. Uh, so, I, my first trip, and I bought a P-35, I was in the Air Force, and I took my youngest daughter, and we went to Sun and Fun, camp next to old Bob, and we ended up doing that for two or three years. Old Bob's just a really great guy. But what he liked, he had a V-35B. And he didn't like going fast. He liked flying right there, which is about 120 uh, knots. He'd fly there all the time. And he just, you don't burn much gas. And that was his thing. And he'd just go forever, not burning much gas. And the point to me about knowing this box, okay, the boundaries here, is, is that what's valuable to us when we use this? I think one of the things that we can think about the value of this is uh, to divert. If you're flying in IMC and you're, you know, you're running the gas pretty close and you have to go mist and then divert to another field, what's the best speed to fly? Well, my nickel will be that it's L over D max. It's not going there at 150, 160, 170 true. It's L over D max because I don't want to use much fuel to do it. And I have a story to tell on myself about this. Okay, so, uh, oh, by the way, there's a fellow named Dr. Bill Compton. He's got a V-35TC. He loves using L over D max to fly over water, long distance over water. And <clears throat> he's actually writing a book about it. John Whitehead is helping him work out this. So if you like to read about this stuff, he's got a book coming out. They're still arguing about the title, so I can't give the title. Uh, but watch for it. I think it'll be a great book, uh, a lot of good, good stuff to read. So the story I have to tell is... Uh, my last job in the Air Force was teaching new people how to fly the Strike Eagle, okay? And uh, we operated all our air-to-air -air stuff was, 98% uh, of it was in the whiskey areas, and I was in North Carolina, so it was out over water. So it started about 10 miles from shore and went out about 250 miles. So a great big area. And when you're flying fast airplanes, you need a lot of area. So uh, this particular flight, I'm doing a BFM ride with a student, and uh, two, two ship, and he's in the other airplane. And we're out, and we're trying to avoid a lot of weather that's in closer to shore. So the weather's pushing us further and further out. And I'm walked, looking at, okay, how much fuel do I have? And then when you're flying an airplane like that, 
that's what you think about. You think it's how much fuel do I have? It's time. You know, it's not distance. It's how much time do I have in the air? So that's what I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking about how much gas he has. And we do an engagement and then I call for the gas. And okay, there's just enough to get a short engagement in here. And then we got to head for home because we're pretty far out. And, uh, but I think it'll work out. So we do the engagement and the way he should have flown his airplane, this is where I wasn't really thinking because if instructors are out here, you'll know that students want to kill you. <laughs> I don't know if it's a personal thing or what, but, <laughs> but generally they want to kill you. So what happened in this case, the student, he used burner when he shouldn't have used it. And uh, when, I, when we terminated the engagement, we started heading home, I called for gas. He is way below bingo, way below bingo, which is that minimum, minimum fuel. Actually, he should have called that during the fight, called the bingo thing, but he's way below it now. Okay, it's all on me. I'm the instructor. We've got to get home. So I'm thinking, I've got 180 miles to get to land, and then I've got another 60 miles to get to Seymour Johnson. So I've got a long ways to go. So what we did was... We used AOA in the Air Force. I don't know what the Navy thinks or what people talk about AOA, but we use AOA. And I, was, I just pulled back to optimum AOA, which in that airplane was 18 units. So we're doing about 220 knots home. It took almost 40 minutes to get from way out there to Seymour Johnson. And everybody was really mad at me because I should have run out of gas. You've been up too long. You had this, you know, you ran your student below bingo. Yeah, but we landed with more fuel than emergency fuel. That's what Oliver D. Max does for you. Okay, so that's my nickel about thinking about the boundaries and the boxes and stuff like that and, uh, and how they work. All right, so here's another famous box. Thanks to uh, John Deacon and uh, Walter Atkinson and George Brawley, we have the red box. And uh, you can see this is 75% power. I'm gonna blitz through this real quick because what I want, to, I want to show you is the dimensions of the box. And this is all about ICPs, internal cylinder pressures. That's where we're going to burn valves. So we don't want to spend much time there. And oh, there's another one that I want to point out, too, is, is you notice this, this dash line? That's the best power line. So in the POH, when you read the POH, basically it says, this is where you fly to go the fastest. Well, you know, those people who wrote that, they're marketers and they're lawyers, and uh, they don't actually buy the engine. So in my view, it's, that's heinous. So this is 65% uh, power. You notice how the size of the box shrinks, okay? So less power, we don't have to worry so much about so much of that area. And the final is here, below 65% power, there really is no box. We can't hurt, the, can't hurt the engine with ICPs in this situation. So um, the interesting thing is, is, the Cirrus folks, they can't do things the way everybody else does it. They have to do things a little different. So instead of having the red box, they have the red fin. It's the same thing, but it just shows it from a different point of view. Okay, so now at the bottom we have Lena Peak, and at the top we have Richa Peak, and you want to stay outside that fin. So here's the other interesting thing about, uh, about this is, do uh, you remember, the, or you may or may not be aware, we just had an AD for certain uh, Continental engines that had failures. And the real, from my understanding, is the real root cause of this problem is Cirrus guys. They're, they're leaning and spending a lot of time, because everybody's really concerned about EGT. I'll be right up front with you and say, I don't really care much about EGT. I fly a normally aspirated airplane. My EGTs are not gonna exceed the limits of my exhaust metal. Okay, if you're flying a turbo, it's different. Turbo normalized airplane is different. You can actually get pretty hot, and it's going to be a problem. But the way I, the airplanes I fly, it doesn't do that. So the, what happened with the Cirrus guys is they spend a lot of time really concerned about this EGT thing, so they spend a lot of time going through the red box very slowly. And that caused lots of problems that aren't strictly valve related. And that's the, to me, in my understanding, that's the root cause of that issue. So we look at this box and its boundaries, okay, we think about, What's actually happening here in that diagram? I stole this from Mike Bush, by the way. Uh, so on takeoff, uh, we want to have a little extra fuel, all right? We've all heard that adage that fuel cools. 
Well, it does, actually, when you have too much. Too much fuel, uh, you don't burn it all. So it tends to cool things off. That's what's happening here. And uh, what I, I like to do is if I'm going somewhere, I'm going to use full throttle climb. And uh, I might be at 2,500 if I've got a noise obstacle to clear. I might be full power. I'm going to climb all the way to my altitude. But what I'm going to do is lean to 1,300. You might ask yourselves, why would I lean to 1,300? It's density altitude. So the best performance the engine's going to give me is about 1,300. It's like if I'm at uh, Flagstaff and I'm going to take off there, what I'll do is I'll hold the brakes and I'll, I'll lean with power setting set until I'm at 1,300 and then I'll release brakes and go. And generally what I'll do is I've done this several times. That's why I have a pet technique for it. Uh, I'll just accelerate, slow, slowly climb, and then I'll do a couple of circles to get to altitude, and then I'll go where I'm going to go because the mountains around there are pretty tall. So uh, I'm leaning to 1,300 because that's the best performance for whatever density altitude I'm at right now. That's my technique for climbing. And I do just this. I do the big mix mixture pull. When I get to altitude, I'll pull it to, the mixture off to a fuel flow that I know works for me. So in any well-set-up engine, I think you've got about a, any, anywhere from three to uh, a gallon range of where Lena Peak is going to be. So where do you want to be? Generally, I want to be as fast as I can, so I'm going to lean towards the faster part of it uh, to use more fuel, but it is less than if I'm burning rich of peak, and I want to stay rich of peak if I, sometimes, like if I'm doing aerobatics, that's how I do that. But uh, for cruise, this is the way I'm going to run it, and uh, I'm going to pull it back to about 15.3 in my airplane right now is a good lean of peak number, and at 2,500, whatever my speed gives me, then I'm happy. What I watch now is... CHTs. That's what I'm really concerned about because that's going to tell me when I'm going to burn a valve or I'm going to have other, some other problem. That's what I pay attention to is the CHT. So this is the technique. Here's the other thing is when you begin, begin a descent, a lot, of, a lot of talk about what do you do during the descent. It's technique. Do you guys know what the difference between a technique and a procedure is? Anybody offer that? You ever have a... No? Okay. Procedure is put your landing gear down before you land. Technique is when you put your landing gear down. Exactly. A technique is written in blood. There's a reason why you do this thing a certain way because you're going to break the airplane or break yourself. That's it. Everything else is a technique. When you do it, how you do it, other stuff like that. So it, there, the, be careful of when somebody preaches a technique as a procedure because it's not. I mean, there's, there is a difference, and I think it's important. So how I descend is I don't change anything except my manifold pressure on descent. I just keep pulling it back, you know, about two inches, because, again, I like to go fast, so I pull it off two inches at a time, and I stay right at yellow line all the way down if it's not bumpy. That's how I do it. <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about is, is all these different boxes and the boundaries that, that they represent – now we get to, we've talked about uh, G limits, uh, we've talked about uh, control of uh, uh, application, et cetera, L over D max, and uh, the engine, uh, stuff like this. Let's talk about personal stuff, okay? This is my dad, this is my Stearman when it was my dad's, and uh, this is where I grew up. I mentioned Cardi's Airport, it's on outside downwind at Randolph, or was, it's not there anymore. And uh, this is where I spent every Saturday and Sunday when I was growing up. On the other side of the airplane, there's these uh, rusty metal rocking chairs, you know, and that's where you'd sit in grade landings because the runway's just right over here, and you grade landings and takeoffs and tell stories. It was a great place to grow up. My dad, my job was to strap people in the airplane. And, uh, and when he passed away, I went through his logbook. He'd given over 1,300 rides in that airplane. Days before insurance. The reason I'm showing it really, though, is because it's a tail dragger. And my point is, is that if I'm a good pilot at all, it's because of this airplane. Because I learned what, the, I learned what my feet are for, I learned what the rudder is for, and I use it. And as what I'm suggesting to you is, as, uh, I'm, I'm a, if you haven't noticed, I'm a huge believer in training. So do a tail dragger checkout. Learn to use your feet. 
it will expand your own personal boundaries. And I think that's important. So another personal boundary that is a hoot is seaplane flying. Uh, I actually bought a Husky because I really want to do this. I got my seaplane ticket, geez, in 04, that's almost 20 years ago, and I have 3.8 hours. <laughs> and you know the funny thing about the FAA is that means I can teach in it. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> no. But what, what I'm saying is, is that you should try it yourself. Go out and do a little bit of seaplane flying, and you can get your ticket, and uh, that'll, that'll get your uh, BFR requirement, your flight review requirement done. And uh, you'll learn some really cool stuff. It is really fun to fly. You can't rent. You can't rent seaplanes. Another airplane I think that is really a great experience is uh, the flying gliders. You want to really learn what best glide is and what men's sink is, you fly these airplanes. And you learn about speed and what its relationship to uh, the whole equation is. It's really fascinating. But there's one other thing that I think is really, really incredibly important, and that's adverse yaw. And you go, what? What do you talk about? Look at this wing. This, is, this wing has got to be 70 plus feet, I think. But look at that aileron. That's huge, and it's way out on the wing. So every, what I, I've got three flights in a uh, sailplane, and what I learned is, is there's so much adverse yaw when you use that, you're going to be using the rudder. You're booting a whole bunch of rudder every time you do. So there's so many things you can learn from not even getting your ticket, just flying it a few times. I think it's a great experience. So this is how we personally push our boundaries so we don't do the same hour 10,000 times. This is the... Uh, uh, another thing about a box that's relevant to flying here, and this is my UPRT box, my uh, loss of control. Uh, so I do, a, I do the UPRT course in my Bonanza, and invariably when you see this picture for the first time, what do you think happens? You go, and, excuse me for cussing real quick, it's, it's holy shit. I've never seen that much ground. And from my perspective as an instructor, probably 99% of the students I fly with, they cannot process this, no matter how much I've talked about it and about what to do next. They can't process that with what they have to do. Okay? And what I'm trying to do is, is foot stomp the importance of, trying, of falling off the edge of the world under controlled conditions before it happens to you for real. So that's my nickel on doing UPRT. You don't have to do it with me. You do it with somebody else in different kind of airplanes. But I really think that UPRT is a lifesaver because it teaches you how to feel the airplane and understand what it's telling you. Because it's talking to you. You just don't, may not understand the language that it's speaking. So experience that before you go any further. This is another favorite view of mine right there. Uh, so... This is, uh, again, when students see this for the first time, it's more like, wow, what do I do next? And we want to we wanna get through that and the ability to focus on what it is that you do next. So you don't really, and you don't spend any time, if this happened to you, you don't spend any time looking at it. You just focus, okay, I know what I have to do. And you execute that program. Loss of control way happens. It happens way too often. So I have another story to tell. So uh, an upset is, doesn't mean you're a bad pilot. It just means you're flying, and you were unlucky. So I'm flying this airplane, not actually this particular airplane, but I was flying the Fokker 100 with American, and uh, leaving from the East Coast, I can't remember where, going to Chicago. Beautiful day, spring day. The uh, uh, flow was uh, east. So all the landings were on uh, nines on the nine runways, and what they do there is is the all the west coast traffic they'll build conga lines that are 150 miles long of airplanes lining up to land, and what they'll do is they'll build a hole for all those guys that are coming from the east, right, to land. So you'll be doing you'll be flying along. There's Chicago right down there. I'm in 10,000 foot downwind. They do the same thing at DFW, basically, but they land north-south. So um, anyway, 
Chicago's right there, and I'm flying along. Who are they going to slot me in behind? And on this particular day, they slotted me in behind a 747. And days gone by, you know, I had a radar. I could just lock him up, and I can tell what his speed is, his altitude is, and how far he is from me. I don't have any of that. And I don't know if you've noticed, but big airplanes, when you're, uh, uh, in, when you're looking at them in the sky, you can't really tell how far they are from you. So you have to, if you're in this situation, you have to trust the uh, air traffic controllers. So, um, okay, I'm a little nervous. I think he's close, but that's fine. I gotta do what I gotta do. I'm doing a visual approach backed up by the ILS. Gear flaps, and then just as I get, the, get configured that way, the airplane starts to rumble, you know, like it's a stall. It's telling me that, you know, I'm getting that uh, the, the stall indication, you know, that uh, I'm getting rumbling. Uh, I feel it in the airplane. And I go, what's going on? My speed is good. I'm, I'm configured. I got flaps down. And then all of a sudden, the airplane does this. It rolls to about 70 degrees, and those pitches down about 15 to 20 degrees, just like that. Just like that, just so fast. And I reach up and I shove the throttles all the way forward and the captain grabs my hand and I said, I'm sorry, I wanted the thrust. And he goes, I just want to make sure that you got all there is. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the airlines, you never use full power, ever. So that's what happened. And what I did then was is I unloaded and was, during the unloaded unload, I used the right rudder and right aileron, a coordinated roll out of that and recovered the airplane back to level flight. And we ended up losing about 200-ish feet, 250 feet. And we continued the landing. But my point is, is that it happens to you when you least expect it. You, and if you don't know what to do right then, then you can be in trouble. Question. Yes. Uh, here's an interesting sidebar to, uh, to that. I found out that, well, I was under the impression that they had distance, distances to follow, just like they do in, uh, you know, in, regular, in regular sky, five miles or so. So I thought that was, they had some kind of limit. They don't. It was a total shock to me that they press the uh, distance following limits all the time, every day, especially at these big airports, because otherwise they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be able to get all the traffic in. So that was a big surprise to me. And uh, if you're in that situation, you got to be aware of it. And you think about what I could have done different is, is I could have been a little higher, you know, above that 7.4. And so I can have my profile be below, above him because his wake vortex is going to sink. And uh, generally, it's going to sink. The winds might keep it there a little bit, but if I'm above his profile, then I'm not going to encounter it. Uh, I didn't think about that stuff. Think about it now, but I didn't then. So I was going to say one more thing, but I forgot. You just can't, you, you can't plan against it, that it's not going to happen to me. It's going to happen. Um, so one thing to think about boxes is... Uh, there's two aspects as, as a student, as a regular pilot. I remember I said everybody's a student. I don't care if you're an instructor or not. I think that's one thing that sometimes we lose sight of is as instructors, we were students. So as instructors, what we need to do is, is think about that, pers that perspective that the student has. Like the first time you see a lot of ground and you depart the airplane, I know that's going to happen because it's happened to me. And I, I see it from all the students I go through. So I, it's a perspective that I understand and I try to allow for and teach for. But as students, I think that you need to have that, uh, that perspective as well. Okay? Know that you may not be perfect. You may not execute this uh, maneuver perfectly. Okay? And it may be a while since you've done it, so you don't execute it perfectly because of that. But you've got to allow yourself a little bit of room to be human and learn from the mistakes you make. That's, the, that's really the issue there, in my view. Um, I was going to talk about more instructor stuff, but I'm running a little long. So uh, as humans, we all carry these boxes around with us. And uh, we're programmed to see things and look for patterns in certain ways. We get used to our experience, et cetera, tells us about these particular patterns. And this is what we're looking for, and we want to satisfy that. 
So the, the thing to keep in mind is, is that your perception or your belief of what the pattern for success is on any particular maneuver or box you're flying in is not right. It doesn't match reality, okay? And that is the point, is, is, is being able to, to execute the maneuver that you need to do, but you also have your perception set so you can realize what's going on. All right, this is uh, an accident you may have heard of. It's a 1978 A36 uh, that crashed at Big Bear on the 1st of May. And uh, he took off from uh, Corona, three people on board, and they all died. It looks like from the fuselage, you know, in a normal accident, I would say uh, engine out or whatever, when I do accident reviews and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what happened, if I see the fuselage like that, I'm thinking, that fuselage is intact. That means their odds of survival are good. They didn't survive. And uh, I'm going to talk about that. So this was the 30th of April, okay? That's one trip around the pattern and land at six minutes, 0.1 hours, which happened to be the first flight for this airplane and presumably the pilot in six months. This is the day before the accident at seven in the evening. And then the next morning, just about lunchtime, he took off from uh, Temecula, French Valley, and went to Corona. About, 11, about 11.30, and uh, two hours later, uh, presumably he met some people there for lunch, and then they decided to go to Big Bear. And this is Big Bear here, the trip. Okay, they took off out of Corona, and Ontario is right here, and their Class C goes down all the way to here. Um, so what he, decides, the, what he decides to do is he does two circles to gain altitude, flies up this way. This is the Class C is just right there and does another circle, and then goes over Lake Matthews, uh, and then March Air Force Base. He clears March Air Force Base Class C and continues the climb to over 10,000 feet to get me above that ridge going into Big Bear. And that, that hit right there, the last hit, is basically a wide downwind, uh, left downwind, for the landing to the west at Big Bear. And the last hit happened at 7,900 7, feet. The pattern altitude is 7,800 feet. Ground level is 6,800 feet there. So what happened? Well, that's pretty interesting. There's, some, uh, there's not enough data to really give a definitive view of what happened. What I can tell you that we do know is the airplane's fully configured, okay? It, I don't know about flaps so much, but I do know about gear. The left gear is up, and in that previous shot, you can see the nose gear, so the gear was down. This is the left wing, right here. Scrapes the ground and then starts spinning, okay? What happened was, is the airplane stalled. Left wing first touches the ground. It would have spun, but the ground interrupted the spin. So it wasn't a full aerodynamic spin. But what happened was, is heat, it, it, the, it, that dragging wing started spinning the airplane around, and apparently there's some concrete structure right here that's the right wing, right there. It lost a little bit of the left wing tip right there, but the, uh, virtually the entire right wing is sheared off right there. And the, it also hit the engine. So when you think about that impact, what happened was it was the G that was fatal in this situation. Our, little, our bodies aren't built for too much uh, G acceleration like that, and uh, the, that's what happened to those poor guys. They didn't survive. You can see right here, this is, this is what's left of the engine. So can they determine whether it was actually mechanical? I'm not sure. We'll see. There's not a lot left of that engine put together unless it's really, really obvious. Uh, but uh, he was low on power. Okay, so I think there was an engine failure of some kind. Um, what I th uh, and here's, here's mine. You can see the nose gear right there. So... Uh, I will, I will say that one of the things to think about that might have happened here is a uh, uh, fuel and porting incident. There was no fire. If that wing was full, if that right wing was full of gas, when it hit that concrete barrier, it would have vaporized, and with all that metal rending and ripping apart like that, there would have been sparks, and there would have been a big fire, just like that. There's no fire. 
No fire tells me there was little to no fuel in that tank. You know, the NTSB is going to investigate and they're probably going to look at was there refueling done at uh, Temecula or was there refueling done at, uh, and how much fuel did he take at Corona? But right now, that's a question to me. That's one of the things that I'd be interested in is just if one of those things happened because there's no fire and there should have been in that kind of, uh, that kind of accident. So I'm feeling porting. So if you've been through the ABS uh, thing on this, right, there's a video that I did. I don't know if you've watched it or not. Tom included it in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the syllabus to, to look at it. What I found in my A36 was is that six gallons is a good safe number for a decent, a regular decent. You're not going to unport. But if you're less than that, you stand the chance of unporting. If you're less than three gallons, you will unport. And I've, I saw it in my testing that um, I unported the engine for as long as a minute. You know, there's plenty of fuel in there and it's going to slosh around, but it unported for as long as a minute during that whole, uh, whole evolution. And just to be, realize what I did was, is uh, I didn't actually run the engine off that. I used to, I had those CIS senders and they're super accurate, so I could tell what was really going on. And I used the, I ran the engine down to these test amounts and then used the data while I was during the descent. So I didn't shut the engine down. <laughs> but I think fuel importing very possibly could, do, could have been this situation. I, when I look through the accident numbers, almost every year I see three to five of fuel, what I think are probably fuel importing accidents. So you think about this is um, we t said the airplane hadn't flown in six months. On well, the previous year, it had flown 11 times, including these three flights, for less than 10 hours. So that brings up a proficiency issue to me. Was this pilot proficient? Was he even current? Uh, I would say with one landing and a tenth and six months, he probably was not landing current. But there's, this is when you look at the weather that existed that day. This is where he took off from Corona. There's rain in the area, and then there's icing and a little bit of snow. There's a lot of questions in my mind. And when I pick an accident to review, most of the time I pick one because I think there's lessons that we can learn from this accident and talk about so then we can avoid those situations. The thing about accidents are is, uh, I think I'm a safe pilot. Well, that means if you're a safe pilot, you're making the good decisions and thinking about it every time you fly. It's not because you are, it's not going to happen to me, it's because any one of these accidents could happen if we let it slip and we don't use our good judgment uh, to, to continue on and uh, execute that flight. So is it a mechanical failure? Is it a simple loss of control? I don't know. There's a lot of stuff to learn here, uh, but I do think it's going to be a good lesson to learn. Okay. Here's one more thing about uh, boxes and designs I want to talk about here is glass cockpits. Okay. This airplane is vertical right now. All right, you can't see the G3X or the 275 very, very well, so I'm going to zoom in on that. And unfortunately, it's not, uh, it, uh, it's a little granular. I sh maybe I should have shot it in 4K. But notice this, that I'm nearly vertical, all right? But the, if you look at the display, it doesn't look that way. But what we see from the display is blue and ground, okay? About 100 knots, half a G. That's you're just floating over the top. That's about the right profile, the right speed, the right energy situation to go over the top in a loop. And that's what this was done. Uh, that's where I, I pulled it from. So that ground there, all right? Think about this. That, I just told you the airplane's vertical. I was there. You look at that attitude indicator, it's showing that that's not vertical, right? Because if we're vertical, the ground is here. It should be this way if you see it at all. That's why I want to talk about this, okay? Because in the early glass days, the, uh, they wouldn't show you where the ground was. If you got your nose high so far, or if your nose is low so much, you wouldn't see the opposite. You wouldn't see the ground or the air if your nose, uh, nose low. So the, they used to have these nadir circles. So if you're going straight up, there'd be a circle right at the 90 degree point with an X in it. 
and there'd be a circle, down, actually a zero, and then down here there'd be one with an X. So then you know exactly what 90 degrees is. But that means that you're going there. You know, in a GA airplane, you don't go there. So why would you even know that? So where this comes from, actually, I believe this ground, this is not a real display. It's a computed one, and they do it on a purpose, okay? And it's for spatial disorientation. Uh, a friend of mine was, uh, actually two friends, uh, were doing uh, intercepts in those whiskey areas I was talking about, and it was at nighttime, and they're doing lights out. And uh, sometimes uh, over the ocean, uh, JFK experienced it, Junior uh, uh, experienced it, you know, when he had spatial disorientation, and the clouds can be, the humidity can be such that you don't really see the stars versus the uh, boats on the, on the water. So you can easily confuse the boats on the water for stars, and this is the ground, or the water. And then that's what happened in this instance. Their lights out, doing an intercept, and for some, some reason, uh, they get going downhill pretty fast, over 600 knots. The attitude indicator did not show anything about where the ground or the sky was. So the pilot goes, I don't know what the heck's happening. We're just accelerating, so he punches out, okay? Uh, fr my friend was in the back seat of the airplane. He was, doing the, he was running the radar, so he was totally absorbed with running the radar, and unfortunately, the front seater didn't say bailout, 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 and uh, Dennis White was the guy in the back seat. He died, because he was not ready for the ejection. At 660 knots, they figured out was the speed that's actually approaching the speed of sound, you have to be ready for the ejection, and he didn't survive. What came out of that accident, and this was, we had one color display in the Strike Eagle at that time, and everything else was monochrome. So what came out of that accident is this, okay? And this changed glass cockpits everywhere very rapidly. So what'll ha what they do is, is they compute where the ground is and then give you a false picture of it. I say false because that's not actually reality. It's vertical. It's over, the real attitude's over here, but it shows you where the shortest, place, shortest way to the ground is. It's glass. That's what it's showing you. The reason I'm talking about this is because Dennis passed away, and he, his, his legacy essentially is this issue for us to know what to be able to survive special disorientation in a very high, uh, nose high, uh, unusual attitude. And that's one of those boxes I think we have to know, we need to know when we uh, operate with an airplane. And it's incumbent on us as instructors and then as students to be receptive to these kind of things. So this is my uh, youngest, she's a pilot, and uh, this is her first loop. So she's doing it. Um, we do 4G loops in the airplane. Uh, I'm a 4G guy nowadays, I don't do any more than that. And uh, she's doing right, you look left, when you, when you lose sight, all you see is the sky, then you look left for your orientation. And you hope that as an instructor, you've taught them and everything turns out like that. <laughs> That's the positive end of being an instructor when you, when you do that and it all works out. Um, the, what I'm trying to say here is, is that um, we can teach skills like doing a loop. That's generally what we focus on is doing skills and proficiency flying, and other things like that. But what we don't do, I think, a very good job at, is we don't teach judgment very well, and we don't teach aeronautical decision-making very well. I think that's, and that to me is that's one of the reasons I'm here today to talk to you about it, and talk about these things, and to get you to start thinking about these things, because I, I think what works here is BS sessions. Basically, that's what, I'm, what we're trying to do here. And uh, it's those, those crosstalks between each other and talking about flying. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's human, last I checked. So uh, it's all about EDM, I think, deciding when you can fly, how to fly. So remember I talked about this is another box here, and, and, and uh, this is why I love to do slow flight as an instructor. I love to put the, I'm an evil, evil guy if you ever fly with me. So I like to put you at slow flight and then tell you to make a turn, okay? So when you look at this, this is, this is really wonderful here. No deflection, 
your stall is here. That's the L over D max. This is the curve everybody's used to seeing. The L over D max is here. That's where the stall is going to happen, right? Boom, we're going to exceed the critical angle of attack. The airplane's going to stall. So what happens if we deflect the aileron? Not only are we going to get adverse yaw in a worst case situation here, but the deflected control changes the L over D max and the airplane's going to stall. Okay? That's why I like to be right at the, the uh, beeper on uh, slow flight and then have them do a, do a turn and invariably they'll, go, they'll try to roll into 30 degrees of bank and it'll stall just like that. It takes energy to turn. So you remember when I pointed out earlier what the limits are for a loop versus an Immelman in the, in the uh, F-33C? Why is it uh, nine knots faster? That is the reason why. Because to do the Immelman, you've got to roll it. You actually use a little rudder, too, so you don't yaw it too much. But you roll it, and that brings you closer to the stall. If you don't have that extra, those few extra knots, you're going to be right here and start to spin. That's the importance of that. Not that I expect you to be doing that in your A36 or your V35B. Yeah? So if they're getting crazy slow, say on base to final, this is going to that's when we're doing this up there in high demoing or whatever. Yes. It's going to show them that they're going to understand that hey, if we're if the small warning's going off, you make that turn on the final, you're going to you're too slow or AOA is too much, and yeah. there you go. The airplane's going to stall. The question is is the, this is applicable. Actually, more of a comment, really. It's applicable to that turn from uh, base turn or from uh, you know on the base turn when you're turning and you're slow and you turn too much, you can be right at the stall. And it is. Any turn you make is going to use energy, and if you're really close to the stall, you're going to induce it. And the other thing that happens then is it's adverse yaw. And there's two things you need to depart an airplane. In order, you need a stall and then you need yaw. So what happens when you move the aileron? Adverse yaw. I think there's only, in my, in my memory, there's only like a couple of airplanes that are designed in such a way that you don't get adverse yaw in any significant amount. But for all the airplanes we fly, you do. So every time you use the ailerons, and if you're slow, you're introducing adverse yaw, which means that what do we need to depart? We need to stall, and then we need yaw. So it's really close. I had another question? Uh, you were describing that point, you know, uh, the stall point where you're with the R is L over D max, but that's your... That's, that's, the, that's the boundary layer break. I actually corrected myself when I was talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. It's actually the boundary layer break. That's where the stall happens. Okay? The boundary of the... Sorry? I missed one word. The boundary of... Boundary layer. Oh, boundary okay, layer. so when we talk about angle of attack, that's relative wind. What's really happening is, is uh, and it's, it's boundary layer is fascinating, actually. It's a physics thing. So what's happening is, is the air will split, and there's some of the air is going to go underneath the airplane. And, oh, by the way, you're going to get some lift here, by the way, mass flow hitting the bottom of the wing. But the air that goes over the top is then you're going to have a, a, a boundary layer where the speed shears to near zero. Okay, the airspeed shears to near zero, but it's a smooth flow. A laminar flow wing keeps the boundary layer attached all, almost all the way to the very back end of the wing. Okay, and uh, conversely, cirruses have uh, laminar flow wings. It's much actually harder to get a laminar flow wing, it takes longer to get it flying again once you've stalled it than it does a regular cord wing like this, okay, like our Bonanzas. So, what happens is in a stall is the boundary layer will start to separate. If this was here, the ailerons, et cetera, were here, it'll start to separate and you'll see, feel some burble, and then it'll start to go forward. It'll progress forward. And as it does, that boundary layer is detaching. That's when we've exceeded the critical line of attack. And it goes so far forward now, the wing can't produce enough lift to continue to fly. And that's when we have a stall break. Does that make sense? All right, so that's pretty much uh, my talk. Um, 
uh, we talk about boxes and operating inside boxes and knowing boundaries. It's really about knowing boundaries and exploring our personal boundaries and maybe pushing those out a little bit through either through regular training or trying to extend our experience levels. So now I'd uh, be happy to have a few more questions. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the talk about boxes. I cut off the questions because that added almost another 30 minutes to the talk, and uh, this one was pushing long for one of my regular videos. But uh, a lot of good stuff, I think, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And uh, these are my Patreon supporters. I really appreciate you sticking with me. I haven't done a lot of videos lately because I've been super, super busy and uh, burning the candle at both ends, basically. I'm GC in my hangar apartment build, and that's soaking up so much time. Uh, I haven't been able to just do what I regularly do. I haven't even been flying, so don't be, don't be too mad that I haven't done any videos. I haven't even been flying instead. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire. Stuff. He's got some very, very interesting uh, history clap, clap. as well. He's clapping for himself now. All right, good job. <laughs> and uh, Scott is also a, uh, a BPPP instructor. I did my flight training with him uh, a couple of years ago. It was very, very interesting and a lot of fun. He's going to talk to us about staying in the box. Okay.